Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, show 209, recorded from River Road Studio in beautiful Eugene, Oregon. Today's show is brought to you by the Herbal Nerd Society. Candace, take it away. Oh, take it away. Take it away. Take it away. The Herbal Nerd Society is a group of folks who have been kind enough to support us in all that we do. In exchange for their wonderful support, we offer them articles, we offer them special content, we offer them gifts of gratitude every month. Every or, month, every show. Every month. Every show. Every show. We say we thank them on every show. Uh, without the Urban Learn Society uh, support, uh, we would not be able to bring you this podcast. Um, because that is 100% the, because true. Because of the um, costs incurred with running a podcast like this. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Urban Learn Society. Well, uh, we had uh, Jimmy Betts in, and he was talking about um, crisis medicine. Crisis medicine, I'm sorry. And he gave us a um, discussion on some different herbs that uh, he finds that they useful when he's doing that. Uh, so I think um, without further ado, we can go right into our intro. What do you think? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, your host. Hey! <laughs> After 200 and some of these shows, you think I'd get this. Now, here are your hosts, Candace Hunter and Patrick Hunter. I'm Candace Hunter. And I'm Patrick Hunter. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism Radio. Radio. It's so odd for me to say that because I'm not normally I'm the one listening to that. Oh my gosh, you've been listening to that for 206 episodes or something like right. that? Right. I always <laughs> listen to it and I always smile when you when you and Sue would, would finish that off. Yeah. Uh, but as you know, Sue has Sue is moved on to, yep. to greener pastures. You can find Sue at the integratedherbalist.com. Please do. She's got a lot going on there. And I'm excited to see how things grow and change for her over the next few months. Right. Um, so we had Jimmy in, and it was a really interesting conversation. The first one that we had with him um, way back in the spring uh, of last year was, was interesting because of the whole idea of, of – you know him being on kind of the front lines of of, of helping people uh, in in crisis situations, and then you know we felt we felt that we should get him back and say you know what so what do you exactly how are you helping people? Yeah, when I first met Jimmy, I wasn't sure what to expect. Sue knows a lot of activists, and they come in so many different varieties, and you know some of them are really like edgy, and I was for some reason I was thinking maybe he was going to be the edgy type, right? Which I like, I like all of them. I mean, I love all of them, and I love that they're doing the work they're doing, but that edgy energy is a little bit challenging for me at times. It's just it, it, it's rough, and I'm so sensitive, <laughs> you know? Right. But he wasn't at all. He was gentle and kind, and he was, and he was so interesting. He's uh, like, like Sue did say he was a very deep thinker, and she's right. He, he thinks about things in the world deeply and with such care and understanding, so... Yeah, it was delightful to meet him the first time, and I was so thankful when he decided to come back. For sure. So did you want to talk about uh, some of the things, um, some of the, the um, herbs that he mentioned? Do you have anything to to bring in or add to that? I don't have a ton to add on the herbs that he mentioned. I mean, he mentioned a lot of really good plants, and, you know, there's there's a lot. Um, I was thinking, you know, after after the show, I was thinking about the herbs that we ended up turning to over the holidays the last, you know, about a month ago. Uh -huh. We were, flu went through our house, which was Freaking not pleasant. Flu. Yeah, it wasn't pleasant. Um, but we did some of the herbs. In fact, a, a decent handful of the herbs that he mentioned were ones that we had drawn upon to treat our family, to help our family get through it and kick it. And, mm -hmm. and um, those of us that took more herbs got better faster than those of us who did not take as much of the herbs. You know, as, as you were, as you were just saying that I thought back to, to the December of sickness mm -hmm. and, <laughs> you know, typically if one of us in the house gets it, we all get it. And we all go and we usually go in waves. We don't typically get it all at the same time. Yeah. One will get it. Another one will get it. Another one will get it. And it yeah. looks different in each of us. But I thought what was really interesting this year is, um, anyway, for me, uh, I, I felt that it was coming on and immediately started taking different actions. But but prior to that, I noticed that I had not – part of what um, – one of the dietary changes we made last year, or you made specifically, Candice, was that you said, okay, I'm done eating grain for a while. Yeah. And um, because I'm your partner yeah. and I, I make a lot of the food, <laughs> I figured, well, I should probably just eliminate it 
as well. That it's easy. Yeah, for you me. reduced considerably. I reduced yeah. considerably because I was you know the bread, bread eater in the house. Oh yeah. And and so I, we did that, and I think a combination of of reduction in grain and a reduction in sugar. I mean, I don't I, yeah. I don't eat. I mean, I've had more sugar in the last two weeks than I've had like I think for six months. Uh, but uh, well, the last two weeks previous to previous the, to the flu, the flu, yeah. Um, and I think those two things helped my immune system battle what took out our son. Yeah, I mean he's, se- yeah, he's he seventeen is, and he, he has crashed. not he has not reduced sugar or grain or <laughs> or anything, anything else. else because <laughs> mom and dad are crazy with all of our dietary stuff and he refuses to be any part of that. Which you know he's a teenager that's what they're going to do. Uh, but I will say, of the three of us, he, he crashed for five days and yeah. was out. He missed school. He had a terrible cough. He had fever. Oh, he had all that, that stuff. That was awful. It was like a you racking know. cough. It was bad. The worst that it got for me was just feeling tired and achy one or two days. But I never got the cough. I never got the the nasal problems. I never got mm-hmm. anything like I had the previous year. Yeah. And the previous year, I was, you know, all grain, sugar. It was just a regular thing. And I think... You know, and, and I have no evidence other than my own guesses. Guesses, yeah. but those are the big things and changes I made this in this last year, and that made a big difference. So, along with the, I think that helped with the effectiveness of the herbs that you decided um, that would be good for us to to do. Right. You know, like the elderberry that that you had made and the rose hips and <laughs> and which started off as a syrup but ended up being a jelly. About <laughs> The longer it's right. Out. So one of the things that I did, I, I started off, I could feel it coming on. So I did some um, diaphoretic teas and stuff and, and I got under the covers and I spent a day just being warm. But during that day, while I was working on driving up my temperature and getting you know sweating and, and getting the fever like symptoms, you know, to drive it back out of my system, I also got a crock pot going. And I put in a bunch of elderberries, dried elderberries and dried rose hips. And um, I can't remember. I think I might have put one or two other things in probably. I'm sure I put some bitter herbs and I probably put elecampane in there. No, I don't I don't know about that one. But you might have. Maybe. But I, I put a few, few, couple of others. But the whole idea of that was just to make a tea, ultimately a tea or a decoction or a syrup that was going to help take the rebuild my system after I drove out the illness but first I needed to drive the illness out so we did that we let it go for a day strained it off it tasted really good I mean that was fabulous fabulously tasty and we put it into a jar and over the course of four or five days it set it gelled Mm -hmm. all that pectin that's in the rose hips and in the elderberry Really did its job. Right. So at the beginning of the of the process, we were taking sh- two ounce shots of it. Yeah. And then by the end of the process, we were taking two tablespoonfuls of it. Yeah, <laughs> tablespoons deck. on you know, whatever. Right. You know. You you resorted to some toast at one point and some English muffins. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my my because I have a, I have a decadent thing I made years ago that that I'm on my, I have one jar left and I made it with a friend and it was a mince meat and uh, we only bring it on the holiday and. And uh, so I said, I'm having my, my my English muffin. I don't care about you guys. I'm, I'm having my grain. Uh, so, yeah, I stopped taking grains um, partly because I was noticing that no matter how much I ate, I was feeling insatiable. Um, mm-hmm. And grains, I noticed, even with rice, right. it was really getting bad. And I was struggling with weight gain, and I felt like my metabolism was slowing down. It was really – it was not – it was not great, and I was starting to feel mildly concerned about possibly metabolic syndrome or something starting to develop. And the easiest way to reduce stuff in my life was to just eliminate grains. I already was in a position of having very little sugar anyway because I eliminated sugar as a primary thing in my life mm-hmm. years ago. Um, sugar and grains are both a little bit inflammatory or, or they can they can build heat and dampness in your system. And I have more than enough heat and dampness in my system all on my own. So I decided, you know, and and, I, and doing the grains the first few days, reducing or re- eliminating them were, was really tough. You know, the first month was hard. After that, it became very easy because I felt great. And I found that I could eat as much or as little as I wanted and feel satisfied. And 
it was nice. So for me, being grain free was a really positive mm -hmm. change. And I expect that it probably reduced it, some inflammation that had been starting up in my system. Right, right. And I'm thinking it did the same. Reducing probably did the same for you. Yeah, I, I know that um, in the course of uh, the last six months, uh, because of that, I know that some of the consistent knee pains I yeah. was having in that I, they have gone way down. I, and I, and that it wasn't until we just started speaking here that I realized that, oh, sugar is an inflammatory um, grain um, can be that, um, especially if you have it high sugar in your system, yeah. uh, can be that. And, you know, uh, so by cutting that off, I've noticed that I don't have too many days in which my knee hurts at all anymore. Right. Um, and that's been great. I mean, obviously, I did cut out Taekwondo. That that was you yeah. Know, I mean, yeah. one thing I, I didn't want to do but did. Um, but the weightlifting has helped uh, with it. But I think overall, the uh, reduction in, in, in um, inflammation, uh, I think, is is key to that. And I think, you know, we're gonna, we've are gonna we been talking about making some other bigger changes, uh, even this year, dietary-wise, um, that we've been... Partly because we've, I think, for me, we were um, inspired by a friend of ours who, who is a staunch you know, mm -hmm, meat mm -hmm. eater. Uh, and he uh, was told by his doctor, you can either go on... Um, Cholesterol reducing medicine, or you can go for a plant based diet, plant -based fat, which really you means know, animal fat free diet. And yeah, which really means a vegan diet. And he did. And he did. And I was impressed because he is, he was, he's Mr. Foodie and, and he did it for almost as a challenge. He said, Yeah, I'm just going to prove it wrong. And uh, he did. And he lost 30 pounds in, in uh, three, uh, 11 weeks. Yeah. And he said that the diet for him was really easy. He wasn't expecting it to be easy. He thought it would be really hard. And it was, it was really easy for him. And dang, he looks vibrant and he looks alive again. I haven't seen yeah. him look that good in years. Yeah. So that I, so he was an inspiration, um, and I haven't necessarily told him that, but but he'll probably hear this podcast and go, "Oh man, oh shucks." <laughs> um, but you know, back to Jimmy. I, you know, he when he when he, we talked with him, it was it was interesting about all those herbs and bringing it back to um, those crisis herbs that we that you had mentioned. Oh, yeah. You know, and some of the things on his list are, are you know if you could come up with. Five herbs that um, are, you know, you should really think about having in your herbal kitchen. What do you think they are, Candace? The five herbs. Well, I don't know about that for sure. For you, but I can tell you that the five herbs that I used from his list while we were in the holiday flu season mm -hmm. was yarrow, yarrow, which I used as part of that. I used yarrow and elderflower in that diaphoretic tea, mm -hmm. and then I also had some sage honey that I had made. Okay. Both of these from my garden because I happen to have them growing and I dried them and there you go. Okay. Um, the sage tea or the sage honey rather, I just took um, some of it each day while I was trying to prevent the flu from really mm -hmm. getting in. Mm -hmm. um, ginger was that was one of the other ones that I added to that the pectin <laughs> pectin intense the cold jelly. syrup the jelly. Yeah. <laughs> The, 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 the cold jelly? Yep, yep. And I did it partly because um, part of that cold and flu I noticed was a lot of cold spots, like cold spots in my sinuses, those, you know, those spots where it just it aches and it's cold inside and it feels wrong, almost like, mm -hmm. in that case, it almost felt like I was breathing cold air. It was really weird. Yeah, and I, yeah. And I, I, I have, like you probably, mm -hmm. I have um, <clears throat> indicators that... Mm -hmm. When I have a sore throat, a certain type of sore throat coming on, yeah, or and I'm breathing and everything is cold and it shouldn't be. There's like yeah. these things. I'm like, oh no, yeah. It's the first, yeah. And, and sometimes <laughs> we're we, we we ignore them because we're busy and we have things to do and we don't. Well, I'm, I'm kind of time to get sick, but then that's then the as soon as things you, cool down, you're gonna you're gonna get, get sick. sick. So. And, you know, and I didn't want that to be where we went on holiday break, you know, right. and all of a sudden I'm sick now. Yeah. Yeah, and garlic, that's another one. I added oh, loads yeah. of garlic, garlic all the food, all the food when, that yeah, I made. We had were, we, lots. You and I, it's so funny because you and I were um, eating mm -hmm. and home cooked meals, and yeah. all we did, I mean, any excuse to put garlic on stuff oh, or yeah. onions and things, yeah. I was doing. Everything. And garlic, it was interesting everything. because our son, who he was sick during this entire time, so he wasn't eating. And yeah. what he was eating was minimal, you know, soups or whatever. But mm -hmm. trying to get him to do garlic and onions, it's just any time he's like, he's like, I think he does it because he's rebelling against us, you know. <laughs> and maybe know. when he's 10 years from now, he'll be like, yeah, I love my garlic and onions for my flu. But yeah. right now, is anything that we do is wrong. Right. 
Yeah, well, I <clears throat> when I saw him get the flu, I just started adding. I'm like, okay, he's getting sick. I'm putting lots of garlic and onions and everything. Yeah. And I mean, you probably, I probably smelled like garlic and onions. I was drinking, eating so much. I mean, it's probably well, yeah. eking out of my pores. <laughs> well, I didn't the, care. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not getting sick. And the other thing that, that, um, you know, even because the flu is still going. I mean, it's not oh, like yeah. it's over. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it's over for us, hopefully. But I mean, uh, across mm-hmm. the U.S., I mean, it's, it's, pro- it's proliferating. You know, another thing to consider when you're out and you, you get in these feelings, I know you like it. But stop drinking alcohol for the entire time where you're oh, feeling yeah. those symptoms come on because it does. I did, and I, I like my beer, but um, I just said no. I like being not sick better. Yeah. And I and I stopped drinking um, everything until you know even when the symptoms started to abate finally, mm-hmm. um, because I just didn't want to let that flu demon in because the second right. I felt I got weak, it was going to find a chink in my armor and it was going to get in and then I was done and there's nothing I could do. Man, you don't want to ruin your holidays with the flu. That's no. no fun. I mean, we were looking at it at a point where we were possibly going to have, you know, as it was working the days through, we might have had our, our solstice dinner being ruined by one of us being sick. And, yeah. And that's the one. That was, we know, narrowly avoided we that. Narrowly and then avoided it came that. back for Christmas Day and a couple of days after. And yeah. then. We've had it kind of brush with us a little yeah. bit. And then we've been fortunate this, this month to um, just. To hunker down. Well, we take the day, and you we, know. Yeah, we did that during the holidays, and then yeah. by the time January began for us, we start. We were moving again. It was right. fine, but yeah. But you know, taking that time. So don't. If you're gonna, if you're feeling it, come on. You know, do the thing. You know, do the yeah. things that we're talking about, but also well, eliminate those keeping issues. keeping yarrow or elderflower in your house. Yeah. Tea, even if you have to go out and get tea bags from like traditional medicinals or one of the other mm-hmm. tea makers. You know, just keeping some of that in the house is a good idea. Having ginger and garlic and sage in your pantry, using them, especially during flu and cold season, Mm -hmm. it's a really good idea. Chamomile is the other one. I added chamomile to the diaphoretic tea that I made with the yarrow and the elderflower. And then I drank chamomile off and on, just straight up through Mm -hmm. the rest of the the flu episode. (laughs) Uh, But chamomile is very good at settling the stomach and helping the nervous system of the stomach and digestive system calm down and relax. And when you get that area calming down and relaxing, you're giving more area to your immune system to fight off and drive out whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I saw that the flu symptoms that I was seeing in you and, and in Finn were included a stomach nausea and digestive disruption and gassiness and that sort of thing. So I decided for myself I was going to add the chamomile to help ease that, which it did work. So those are our, those were like the standards from Jimmy's list that, you know, we have them in the house all the time. Um, I grow some of them in the yard. I actually Mm -hmm. started growing chamomile, um, just a tiny, like I think there was like three plants that survived the duck incursion. (laughs) (laughs) Duxton decided that she wanted to dig up one of my raised beds, and we had words over that, and she has since stayed out, but I lost most of the little chamomile patch that I had, Um, but I started it the previous summer, so the chamomile that I had was actually a purchase, not from the yard, but but it's a good one to keep around. Um, I did a couple of new to our family herbs, I did two somewhat new ones, Mm. um, one of them that I did for myself as part of just fending it off and helping keep my respiratory system stronger um, was a rose geranium. Mm. So I bought a rose geranium plant a couple of years ago. I keep it as a potted plant. Rose geranium is related to um, umkaloabo, which is same family. So it's pelagonium. Gravelins is the ger- rose geranium mm-hmm. and cytiotes is the umkaloabo. Umkalobo is used in South Africa. Both of these are South African plants, but the umkalobo specifically, I think it's mostly the root, if I remember. Yeah, we used that spray last year. Yeah, and I did. I used that in the. Um, I used that one, and I'll talk about that in just a second, because uh, I used that one with another South African herb for Finn. But for myself, as part of fending it off, I had decided to experiment with this plant, this rose geranium I had Mm -hmm. purchased, and I cut off a few leaves, and I made just a small amount of tincture. I think it's like maybe I made eight ounces maximum Mm -hmm. of this tincture. 
And I thought, well, well, we'll give it a try and see if this helps, because there are a few documented things that I saw <clears throat> that rose geranium has been used as an anti-flu and cold and a respiratory um, supporting herb. So I gave that one a try, and I used a little bit of usnea. And I think that really actually helped prevent, give, I just used a small amount in my water for all the water, that, you know, a few drops each water that I was having. And I think it really helped reduce and mitigate a lot of, because normally for me, respiratory is the way, is the way the flu finds its way in and it hits hard. So my son's coughing and ridiculously sore throat and all the, you know, pain and stuff that he was having, that's like my normal experience. And I didn't have that at all. I used the Amkalobo and I used Spilanthes, which is another South African herb in a um, decoction that I made for him with some pain-killing roots. I think I put Jamaican dogwood, and I can't remember, probably some willow bark. I can't remember for sure what I put in there. Uh, but I put in, you know, I did that. He didn't like that and didn't feel that it was helpful, so I added spilanthes to it and reheated it a second time. And that, he said, was helpful. That, he said, was helpful. Um, the spilanthes was. But he also said that it made it really hard to swallow, which I found interesting. Well, so that's it's the right. first time that's that right. yeah, it's the first time I've used spilanthes um, orally mm -hmm. for anything other. I've I've made a toothache one for someone once, you know, toothache formula for someone once some time ago. But other than that, spilanthes hasn't been a huge player for us. And last year, I bought seeds from uh, Rico Check. Strictly medicinal seeds. I bought some of his seeds and I grew a spilanthes patch and I dried a bunch and I made some tincture. And so for this one, I used a handful of the dried stuff and turned it into this syrup. And sure enough, when I started to get just the tiniest hint of a, like the back of my palate was sore mm -hmm. and I was thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll try this spilanthes and see just because. Right. And it's also good for cold and flu, according to what I've read. Yeah, it was a really strange experience. And I could understand why my son said he couldn't really swallow for a while afterwards. It, it, kicks. it Does it numb? Well, it numbs it, but it also kicks up your saliva reaction. So my oh. mouth is watering as the back of my throat is getting numb. And the it was almost like my muscles just wanted to relax and not swallow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was feeling driven to swallow. <laughs> so it was okay. a really... But it did numb it up, and the bit of pain that I had vanished completely for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then it came back in a very, very mild form. And I think I only ended up taking like two doses of that, and then it was gone, and it didn't return. Okay. So it was an interesting experience. Wow. That's really awesome. Yeah. So those were not necessarily like herbs that are easily available in our area. If you live in a more um, warmer subtropical to tropical area, you could grow those herbs and have them just out in your garden and easily available. Otherwise, you have to bring them in like me with potted plants or just replant every year. Or replant, yeah. 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 If you freeze, you probably have to take care of them. Yeah. If you don't, yeah. then you can probably. Not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, right, cool. Um, so there, we used to do Herbal 101 all the time. Yeah. And we don't know why we got away from it or you know, things change and you don't think about it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to – I think – I don't want to say we're bringing it back, people. But we decided that – We had one question that was really, really good, and I thought we should answer this question. Right, because we do get a lot of questions that we can't answer. Yeah. There's, you know, people that are looking for – um, an actual like formulas formula or, or they want they want to be diagnosed and or they want to do something that ethically isn't right you know those yeah. are the things we can't answer and, and we're really not going to answer those but um, this kind of question do, really does work and these are the kinds of questions we're, we're kind of looking for um, so our herbal 101 question comes from Samantha G and it's G as in G period not G as in G E so mm -hmm. it's from Samantha and she asks if you are allergic to an NSAID medication such as ibuprofen and aspirin, will you also be allergic to willow bark? Thanks. Well, Candace, what do you think? 
That is a really good question, and I wish the answer was just a super simple one, but it actually isn't a super simple one. Okay. Ibuprofen and aspirin work through different mechanisms, chemically speaking. If you are allergic to aspirin, you will probably be allergic to willow bark. I'd be very careful about using that. Ibuprofen, however, is not the same chemical constituents that are in willow bark. If you are allergic to ibuprofen but not aspirin, be careful about using willow bark. Um, you might want to talk with your physicians or pharmacists about that. One of the things that aspirin does and willow bark does is it thins the blood. So if you're on any types of blood thinners, willow bark may not be a good choice for you because it's going to enhance the activity of the blood thinners you're already on. So that's not great. If you have any bleeding conditions like ulcers, bleeding ulcers, especially if those bleeding ulcers are exacerbated by or caused by NSAIDs or aspirins or other painkiller types of medicines, you probably want to avoid willow bark because it can make it worse. Um, willow bark will cause your blood to flow more easily. So oh, we talked about we talked about the the blood thinners. Mm -hmm. And if you have problems with blood clots and are on medication for that, also willow bark's one to possibly possibly probably avoid. Um, if you have other types of allergic reactions, like you get rashes and that sort of thing, you're going to want to be extremely careful with willow bark. If your rashes, if you like, anytime you take aspirin, you're going to get a rash. Yeah, willow bark will probably do that too. If ibuprofen gives you a rash, willow bark may or it may not. If you've experimented and you know that ibuprofen causes problems, Tylenol and other similar ones cause problems, but aspirin does not, chances are willow bark will be a fairly effective and safe one. So it's going to require you to really pay attention to what symptoms you have, what's causing them, and ask good questions. What's a good place or uh, an online resource that they could they could uh, that Samantha could go and read about this or other people if they want to know? I found a really good article that was on the Penn State Hershey Medical Center site, and I'll make sure we get a link to that article in the show notes. Okay. Um, it talks a little bit about what willow bark, what reactions you may or may not get from it, and which drugs and um, it may interact with. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some, and I forgot which, there's one where it could potentiate it or increase the action of the drug. So if willow bark is going to be part of whatever you're doing, you might want to, you know, work with your doctor and do labs to make sure that the drug levels are correct for you. Anytime uh, any herb potentiates or activates a pharmaceutical, you need to potentially go in and talk with your doctor and do the appropriate labs to make sure that the activation, it might change the dosage of what you're taking of your pharmaceutical. So right. you may make sure you do your proper adjusting. Okay. Well, with all that being said, uh, the show has been brought to you by the Herbal Nerd Society. Uh, again, thank you very much for your support. Uh, you make it possible for this to all come together. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on um, iTunes and all the other places that you find podcasts. You can also listen to this at the website. And as always, if you can, leave a review. Uh, we look forward to reading them and possibly airing them occasionally. So, again, if uh, you like it, subscribe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, with that being said, put, put an, an herb, herb on it. it. The statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.